if you find this sleep story helpful or interesting then give it a thumbs up leave any comments that you've got below and if you aren't already subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you can receive notifications of when future sleep stories go live i have dozens and dozens of stories already on my channel that you can go and search i also release new stories every single week so i hope you enjoy this story so just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and with your eyes closed you can begin to relax and as you begin to relax so i'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background and while i tell this sleep meditation in the background you can allow yourself to comfortably drift asleep and i don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words but as you drift asleep, you can have a sense of two twins on a boat. And they're out on their first trip alone together. And these two twins, they've just turned 18. And for their 18th birthday, they're going out across a piece of ocean to an island. I'm going to camp on that island and spend some time proving how independent they are. And so as they travel on that boat, they can hear the wind in the sail, the sound of the waves against the sides of the boat they can notice what the sky looks like feeling the breeze against their faces and they arrive at the island carefully moor up the boat at a jetty and they take their belongings off that boat, walk down the jetty onto the island. And it's quite a large island, but there's no one here. And off on the horizon, they can see the shoreline, the mainland. And as the sun passes across the sky, And the afternoon sets in, gets later and later. So they find a space a little way from the shore, just on the tree line, to set up camp. And they find that almost everything they do is in sync with each other. They don't know whether they believe in telepathy or not. But they sometimes feel like they probably have some kind of telepathic connection. When one does one thing, the other knows what to do at the same time. And they frequently think they know what each other's thinking. And so they set up a reasonably large tent, big enough for the two of them to sleep comfortably in that tent, with plenty of space to walk around in the tent. And they set up that large tent, set up the beds in that large tent. They make that tent so cosy, so comfortable. And they can hear the breeze blowing, making the sides of the tent gently wave and move. They can smell the fresh sea air blowing in through the entrance of the tent. 
And the first thing they do once the tents are all put up and their beds are made. As they lie down on their beds and instantly start to feel like just relaxing for a moment, taking in the beginning of this experience, that kind of relaxation you feel after you've done a task. Or you've just made a bed and you just want to lie down for a moment. With that sense of achievement, that sense that you deserve this. So they just relax there for a bit, not talking to each other, but just listening to the sounds outside the tent. The sound of the sea lapping on the shore. The sounds of birds among the trees behind them. And the sound of the wind. And then as that sun gets lower in the sky and begins to set, So they decide to go out onto the beach, just a short few steps from the entrance to the tent, set up a campfire, place some comfortable chairs near that campfire. And cook themselves some food and have a drink with the dancing light of the campfire and the sight of the setting sun. And that crackling sound of the campfire. And as they cook and eat their food, so they enjoy the smells of that food. They laugh and joke and enjoy this first night. And then notice how the sound of the sea lapping on the shore changes slightly as night falls, how the sound almost sounds broader with a slight echo to it, and they walk barefoot down to the water's edge through that soft sand, through the dry soft sand as they approach the water, and then noticing that sand become firmer and cooler as it becomes damper the closer to the water they get. And then having those waves gently lap on the shore, roll in, tickle their feet, and then roll back out again pulling that fine sand out over their feet, through their toes. And they stand on the water's edge, side by side, gazing out towards where the horizon would be. And they can't see the horizon, because the horizon is as dark as the sky. But they can have a sense for where it is. Because they can see where the stars end. And out here on a deserted island. The quilt of starlight above them. Is twinkling so bright. 
They can see colours in the sky. They can see more stars than they've ever seen. And they feel a sense of scale gazing up. Like that sky must be so large. And they walk back up the beach a little bit, lie down on that soft sand, lying side by side, just staring up at the sky, hearing those waves rolling in further down the beach, and just seeing those stars arching overhead, noticing the occasional shooting star whiz and fizz across the sky, sometimes green, sometimes red, sometimes blue, sometimes the most pure white. And they find themselves naturally falling into conversations of a philosophical nature. Wondering whether there's any other life out there. Wondering if other life out there is doing similar to them here. Gazing up at the night sky, wondering whether any other life is out there. They wonder whether there's any alien spaceships flying around out there. They wonder whether in the future mankind will encounter aliens. What that would be like. How that would change things for humanity. They wonder whether mankind has ever met aliens in the past and what they would have thought of those aliens. They discussed how in the past mankind probably would have thought they were gods coming down from the heavens, landing in balls of fire. and then leaving in these roaring balls of fire. And they found that there was something about lying on a beach, feeling calm, relaxed, gazing up at how large the universe is, arched overhead, that seems to encourage a sense of wonder and conversations of wonder. And that those conversations and that sense of wonder can give a sense of perspective. And really show how small you are in the universe. And their conversation turns to, what if there is no other life out there? And the importance that would place on humanity to preserve the life that's here, to make sure to look after the life that's here, to protect the planet, if that's all there is. And if it isn't all there is, then a focus on going and meeting more life would be an incredible thing for the future. And after a deeper conversation than they've had in years, they head back to the tent. And they sit just outside the tent for a while as that fire burns down to embers.
And as the fire burns down, so it starts crackling faster. A bit like cereal in the morning. And then that subtle glow and that warmth begins to fade. And their feet are fully dry now. So they rub off the sand, head into the tent. They settle down in their beds. They continue their conversations, snuggled up comfortably in their beds. With torchlight glowing around them. That sound of the ocean outside. Feeling so calm and so relaxed. And they drift and float comfortably asleep. And the next morning, they awaken early to the rising sun the sounds of birds around them. They feel so alert and full of energy. They leave the tent. They gaze out over the daytime view. Noticing the difference again in the sound of that sea. And their plan is to explore the island. They're going to walk to the river that will take them inland to the centre of the island. And they'll hike to the centre of that island during the day. And in case they need it, they've got themselves some hammocks they can hang in the trees that come with small tent coverings that almost create a tent for one, a bit like a cocoon. And so they set off towards the river. walk along the edge of that river, heading in towards the centre of the island. And they carry on their conversations as they walk along the edge of that river. And they can hear the river lapping gently against the sides of that river bank. And around the river, the forest gets denser and denser, the more inland they go, and the easiest route to take is to skirt that forest and keep following the river. And this river is a tidal river, the sea water flows in. and fresh water flows out. And as the sea rises and falls through the day, so the river rises and falls. And a wave at the front of that pushes down the river. And after some time, they find their way to the source of the river, to a natural spring. And it seems very small and unassuming. And yet this small looking spring pushes out enough water to push back the sea. to flow that fresh water down towards the ocean. 
and they head up away from the edge of the river up slightly into the forest they stop for something to eat and then one of them gets out a book and in that book is a folded map and they look on that map and they see that they're almost at the location of something they really wanted to try and find They'd heard that there was a chest buried here. They didn't know what was in the chest. But growing up, their dad had kept on talking about a chest on this island. And from his stories, they'd worked out where they thought it might be. And they didn't know if he was telling the truth or just telling bedtime stories. But they enjoyed the idea of one day trying to find out and see what this treasure is if it exists. And so after having something to eat, they find that location they've marked on the map. And they try and see if there's any giveaway signs, anything that might let them know where that chest might be. And they look around them and they notice that generally the trees are very dense. But there's one area where they can just see slightly more light seeming to shine through the trees above. And so they wonder if maybe there's a bit more of a clearing in that area. They think it's a long shot, but they decide that they'll go and check out that area. So they cut through the forest. And as they do, they can hear the rustling leaves overhead as the wind blows a breeze. They can see the dancing shards of light as the sun manages to occasionally burst through the moving leaves. And they reach that clearing. And they get a little camping shovel out of one of the bags. They scrape the topsoil off, they scrape some of the leaves off, some of those twigs off. And they take a look down at the clearing to see if there's any height difference, if there's anything that might give away that something's under the ground. And they notice that some of the, what's growing on the ground isn't quite as thick in one area. And they wonder whether maybe that's because there's something quite shallow under that area. So things can't dig their roots down quite the same there. There isn't quite so much moisture there. So they go to that space. And they dig down carefully. Removing that soil. Until they hear a knock. And they realise they've reached something. And excitedly they carefully nudge down with the spades. Working out the dimensions. Clearing the soil from above that. clearing the soil from around the sides of it slightly. And then together they reach in, lift that out, and place it down next to the hole. And they see that that chest is locked. 
and they don't know how they're going to get into it. They've not got a key. And they've not got any other clues. They decide that what's best would be to take that chest back to the camp where they could work on it some more. Maybe they could pick the lock. So they start carrying that chest back but decide after a while that it's a bit too heavy. So they stop and decide to see if they can pick the lock here. And they start trying to pick that lock, carefully listening to the lock while moving the workings inside the lock up and down until they hear a slight click and then moving to the next bit inside that lock until they hear a slight click again and then holding that bit in place and moving to the next bit and then that lock pops open and they remove the lock And with a slight squeak, they open that lid and they look inside the chest. And inside the chest, they can see an old book. And next to the old book is a small little box. And then what looks like a letter or something inside an envelope. And then next to that, on both sides, are some bars of gold. And they realise that those bars of gold must be what was making this so heavy. And they pick up those bars and they handle them, feel how smooth those bars of gold are. And they put them back down into the chest. They pick up the small little box and they open it and inside they see a golden key and that golden key is on a chain and so one of the twins puts that golden key over their neck and just hangs that over their neck and then the other one looks in the envelope and when they try and read what's written on the paper they find that it seems to just be symbols it doesn't seem to make sense and they turn it over and they both take a look and the way it's written looks like it's meaningful it's just that they don't understand the meaning And then they take out that old book. They can notice how all the pages seem to be almost like they were individually just torn bits of paper turned into a really old book, looking hundreds of years old. And they can't really understand much of the writing in this book either. But they try and look through, they can see there are some illustrations in this book. And they decide that they want to take the book, want to take the key, and want to take the letter with them. They don't feel they need the gold. They want the puzzle, they want to solve this puzzle. So they return that chest, they cover it over. And now, not carrying quite so much, they set off back to their camp. 
and back at the tent. They look through that book. They look at the letter. And they try and compare the two and see if they can work out any kinds of patterns. And they happen to have mobile phones with them. And so they try and look up some of the different symbols, see if they can find any clue as to what any of this might mean. And they start to find some references to certain symbols. And so, in a separate notebook, they start writing down what those symbols mean. And they notice that these symbols mean a different language. So they keep having to use a translator to work out what this language means as they translate a few words at a time. And not only is it a different language, but it's an old version of that different language. And they realise that this book, as they get more and more of the words, seems to be almost like a book of spells, a book of healing. It describes itself as a book that you can heal people by reading to them, by having them enter some kind of a trance state and then reading these spells to them. And if they follow along to these spells, then healing can occur. And that you can say these spells to yourself, allowing that healing to occur for yourself. And they decide that they're going to need plenty of time to work out and decipher the entire book. And the letter, they discover, is about the book. And it tells them that there's even more for them to find. That this was where they'd hidden the last of their treasure. And it talks about how this was the last stand of some witches. That witches became hunted down. That instead of being appreciated for the healing work that they did, people became scared of them. So they turned the last of their money into gold to get out to this island, placed their book of spells in this location. And there's a building on the mainland and the key is for that building. And this is where they hid their witch's past and decided to put all that behind them and just fit in. The people were too scared to be ready to accept help from those who could heal. And the twins talked about how it would be a bit like people with greater knowledge, like aliens, landing and trying to share that knowledge. And if the knowledge is too advanced for them, or seems too alien for them, then some people that can scare them. They can make them feel anxious and worried, perhaps even uncertain. And it's human nature to identify risks. And some people can get stuck on a spiral 
of identifying the risks. Without stepping off that spiral, to take an objective look from a place of calm and peace. And that seems to be what happened here hundreds of years ago. And so the twins settled down for another night, knowing they're heading back to the mainland in the morning. And they drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And the next day, they pack everything away onto their boat. They set back off towards the mainland. And as they travel back to the mainland, they talk about how this was a great trip to make on turning 18. It was an exciting trip to make. And it's a trip that's going to continue to teach them something new with this book. A trip that's going to allow them hopefully to find the building that key opens. And so they head back to the mainland, head home, drop everything off at home, say hello to their parents, freshen up, and then they carry on deciphering that book and the letter. And after deciphering many of the spells in that book, they realise that there's an address. And it's not an address that makes much sense now. But they know from the history of the area that it made sense once in the past. And so they look up where that address would have been. And later that day, they travel off to that address. They jump on their bikes and they cycle some distance, turning into some woodland, cycling through the woodland, passing through a meadow, heading out into a more rural area, cycling down what's barely a road. They pass a field with the most beautiful white horse. They pass a field of sheep. They keep cycling where there's barely any houses. And they'd planned on trying to get back before the sun set. But now we're aware that they probably won't. They let their parents know that they are okay, but they're going to be home a bit later. And they turn down a dirt track, down into what looked like a deserted, perhaps a farm. They didn't know exactly what was going to be down this dirt track. They could notice the low fog as the evening set in. It was hanging over the fields around them, occasionally crossing that dirt track as it escaped from the fields. The way it parted as their bikes went through that fog They could see fireflies among the trees. And 
and the way their backsides glowed even more in the white fog, creating glowing patches of fog. And apart from the sounds of their bikes, there was just silence. There'd be the occasional sounds of crickets. But then as they approached, they would go silent as well. And sometimes there'd be the sound of movement in the sky, perhaps a bird flying out of a tree maybe some bats flying overhead. And eventually they arrived at a rundown property. Didn't look like anyone had lived here for years. The roof on one side of the property had caved in. The walls had half caved in on that side of the property. The other side of the property was still standing and looked structurally okay. And around this property was a low, dense fog. And the girls got their mobile phones out and the torches on their phones. walked into this property and started exploring in the property. And they found a door against a wall. And they tried the key in that door. And as they put that key in the door and they twisted that key, so it sounded like there was a click and a clunk and then a winding sound, almost like clockwork. And then the door opened. They could see some steps going down. And so they followed those steps down deep under this property and they walked down those steps and they found themselves in an underground chamber and were surprised at the size of this chamber and they started exploring they could see different belongings. And they imagined these belongings probably belonged to these witches. And they found some records. Really old newspaper articles. That were more like just sheets of paper not like a newspaper that they're used to. And from everything they've deciphered and what they learned of the language, they realized that some of what was written was diary entries of these witches. And then there were these newspaper clippings, these kind of newspaper pages that seemed to be in Old English about these witches showing that people of the time were fearful of them and they'd kept these different pages, these different articles and they found many other items that showed that these witches were just like anyone else they obviously just knew how to help heal people. They knew how to communicate in a way 
that stimulated healing in others. And then as one of them were exploring, they touched a brick that looked like it was sticking out slightly. They just had that instinctive feeling of wanting to push that brick into place. But when they did, the wall slid open, revealing a secret passage. And they looked at each other and decided to explore that secret passage. And it was a narrower passage, but perfectly tall enough for them to walk through. Just like walking along a normal corridor. And at the end of the corridor, they noticed that it opened out into a room of mirrors and their lights bounced off all those mirrors. They could see themselves in those mirrors. And there was a seat right in the middle of them. And one of them sat down on that seat. And they could see on a silver plaque on the ground. A sign saying to look inside yourself, to see yourself. And so they sat there and they looked at themselves and they could see as they relaxed their vision, themselves in the mirrors at the side. They could see themselves in the mirror in front. They had a sense of themselves in the mirror overhead. And then the other one came and sat down and both twins perched on that chair. And they wondered what this room was all about. And they shone their light around the mirrors. But to properly see themselves they had to aim the light diagonally down so that it bounce around the mirrors and just begin to illuminate the room rather than bounce strongly straight back at them. And as they gazed into those mirrors, both sat there together. One of them got that book out and started looking through the spells. And then picked a spell and said, I think we should read this one while we're here. About good fortune for the future, as we've just turned 18. And so the other twin got the translated version in the notepad, flicked to that page. And together they started reading that spell out loud. And while they read, so they noticed the way that that sound seemed to reverberate around this room. Almost like the spell was bouncing off the mirrors back at them. And as they read, and they fell into a comfortable rhythm of reading, so the strangest thing happened. The light from their phones almost seemed to turn into colours of the rainbow reflecting around those mirrors. There was a rainbow of coloured light reverberating in this room. And they continued comfortably to read and that light continued to pulse and reverberate stronger and stronger until all of a sudden 
it was as if the room didn't exist. The light reverberated and pulsed stronger and stronger and stronger until it all became white light again, getting brighter and brighter. And then it turned into the blue sky of day, the most beautiful country garden, trees around the outside of the garden, the sounds of birds, the warmth of the sun on their face. And as they looked around themselves, they noticed it was as if they were sat on a bench in this country garden. They could see a vegetable patch off at the back of this garden. They could see butterflies and other insects going about their business. They could see birds, hearing those birds. They could see the most beautiful roses just swaying in the breeze. And some of those roses were so close, they could touch those waxy petals. And they looked around themselves in astonishment, curious at what had happened. They were only two thirds of the way through the spell and now they seem to be here. And they can see an oak tree standing tall at the end of the garden that looks like it's been there for an age. So they walk together down this garden, still wondering how they got here and where here is. They reached that oak tree, ran their hands around the bark, noticing how real everything in this garden feels, wondering how they can both be having this experience. And they could see at the back of the garden a meadow, and in that meadow they see someone walking, a basset hound. They gaze up and see a bird of prey on an updraft of warm air, just circling gently high above that meadow. They see some squirrels in the trees, climbing, weaving their way around the trunk of the trees. And they notice they can't hear any cars or any other people. It seems to be a very natural environment. And they look back towards where they've just walked. They see the back side of a beautiful cottage. With the back door open onto this country garden. But as they look back, so they notice the occasional flicker and movement. And they carry on reading that script. They carry on reading that spell. And as they read, so the experience continues to unfold around them. This feeling of comfort. Both thinking this is the future we want to live somewhere beautiful, somewhere natural, somewhere away from the hustle and bustle of busy cities. And they realize that this is a representation of a possible future of theirs. They catch a glimpse of themselves in a pond in the garden as they gaze down and see a frog jumping into that pond. They notice the gnomes fishing in that pond and as they see themselves at first they wonder if they saw what they thought they saw 
and so they look closer as that water becomes stiller. And they realise that they definitely both look older and that this is a representation of their future. And they continue reading that spell. And as they reach the completion of that spell, they sit back down on that bench. And then they just wait and observe the world around them, feeling that this experience is somehow transformative internally for them. Feeling this connection with this place. And then while they remain still, so this reality fades. They can see those mirrors again. The room becomes darker with just the lights from the phones illuminating, bouncing off those mirrors. And they realise that something about being in this room allowed the experience to be more real than perhaps just having the experience of listening to a spell. And that together they had that experience as a shared experience. And they turned and left this room walked back down that secret passage, pressed that brick again as that passage closed, walked out of this room, back out to the main building, and when they reached the main building, they saw an elderly woman stood there and they were startled for a moment before seeing her friendly smile. And she said that she'd been hanging around all this time for these twins to arrive. She said that one of the spells allowed one of them to remain alive in this location, connected to this property, for the time when the right people arrive, to take the torch into the future, and that the two twins are those people, destined to carry that magic forward. And then she handed them both a small bracelet. And they both put the bracelet on each. And as soon as they did, so the property started twinkling and sparkling. Lights started dancing all around them. A swirling, twinkling, sparkling cloud of light started emanating from their feet, up around them, around the woman. And as it did, so it was as if it was drawing the fog into the property, spinning that white fog, illuminated by the sparkling, twinkling light, and a slight hum. And it was as if the woman, who they'd just seen in front of them, vanished and disappeared into that fog almost as if she became part of that fog as it circled around them, getting lighter and lighter, twinkling more and more, with each twinkling light illuminating the fog. And then as that fog began to clear, 
so they notice something incredible. That while the fog was clearing, so there was a light on in this room. And as it continued to clear, the walls looked white and newly painted. And they noticed that this whole room looked brand new. And they walked through to the next room and the next room and they opened doors. And it was as if this entire place had been rebuilt by that fog. And then on a work surface in the kitchen, they saw a handwritten note. Just saying, home sweet home. Happy birthday. And they wondered what that meant. And then as they walked out of the property to take a look from the outside, they could see that the garden had been done up that everything was still glowing, although it was night time, everything around the property was glowing, as if there was light just illuminating this area. They could see that everything was being manicured, that the hedges were no longer overgrown, the garden was no longer overgrown, And as they walked around the other side of the property, they noticed the back garden and that it looked just like the back garden they had just seen. And then back round the front again, hanging on the door, were two keys and a tag on each key with each of their names on the tag. and a letter confirming that this was their home. And they didn't know what to make of this. And they headed back on their bikes as that property dimmed behind them, wondering how to explain all this to their parents. They cycled all the way home, noticing how the fog had lifted, and it was a clear night. On arrival home, it was getting very late. They headed into the house, thinking they'd probably have to just sneak to bed so as not to wake anyone. But as they walked in, so they saw their mum and dad stood there with tears in their eyes, saying how proud they were of them as young adults who they're going to become. And then the dad explains that he'd always known about this experience about what was going to happen today. That he was brought up being told the stories about the future and about his role in presenting the ideas and telling stories as they grew up to encourage them to explore. And that for generations those stories have been passed down For the time when the next set of twins are born in the family, and that it will be that set of twins that will take hold of the property that the previous set of twins in the family used to own. And he knew when they went out and said they were going to be late home, and when they went exploring after visiting the island, 
that they'd obviously found and worked out what they needed to work out. And the dad got out a book that outlined some of the family history. And they sat for many hours learning about those twins hundreds of years ago. About their abilities. And about how that was passed down through generations. And recounted through generations, until now. And that they knew that whenever they're ready, they've got a home they can move into, if they're happy to continue to share that home. And they've got somewhere that's the family home. And that night, the girls went to bed and as they lay there in bed with the moonlight shining in the window, and that curtain just blowing ever so slightly, with that window being slightly open, as that cool breeze just gently blows in across their faces, they talked about the experience about the book, about the future, as they drifted and floated comfortably asleep. And while they slept, they knew they would wake with the most wonderful future ahead of them, with purpose, feeling a sense of security, knowing they've got the security of somewhere to live, the security of such loving and kind parents, and security in many other ways. And they drifted and floated comfortably and relaxed asleep. 